So a few weeks ago, I was playing my Umbrus Horror Tribal List, and you can actually see the video up on my channel. Just go ahead and check that one out once you're done with this video. And I played a card that nobody had ever seen before. It's this one right here, or maybe it's over here. Uchulon, that's the card. It requires you to have things in your opponent's graveyard already. And the table had been kind of giving me a hard time of my, my Umbrus List, saying things like, shouldn't you just be focused on exiling our things instead of milling us? Or... Why are you even running mill effects to begin with? Shouldn't you just focus on exiling our stuff? And Uchulon stuck on the table. It exiled the creature at the end step. And now we're just sort of off to the races. The next turn, I played out my commander. I made two more copies of my Uchi boy. And then the table started to realize that they had a major problem on their hands. I was going to either mill them out if they let this go on any longer or just kill them through either combat damage or commander damage. But unfortunately for them, they had already sort of blown their load getting rid of other things at the table. So I quickly took over the game, making tons of copies of my Uchulon. I exiled people's libraries. I killed them with commander damage. It was just a great time for my Umber deck all around. And this little crab horror guy did a lot of the heavy lifting. And not only was it a surprise for everyone else at the table to see because they had never seen this card before, it was actually a surprise to me too to see this card pop off in such a fashion. And that right there is what inspired me to make this video. It, I wanna sort of take a look at other cards that are unique, that are interesting, or maybe just underrepresented, especially within the blue space. So today, we're gonna be looking at some of the most underrated blue cards in the format and why you should be playing them. Also, uh, you should join along with me. It's just a nice morning <laughs> cup of coffee here. Remember, tell the teachers that made a difference that you still love them. Yep. <clears throat> Uh, this is a more casual video, by the way. I just have, you know, my script in front of me. I mean, I have 20 cards I have to go through. So, like, you know, give me a little bit of a break here. I don't want the video to go on forever. So, at least I have something to go off of. So, we're going to start with some more obvious ones. And then we're going to build up to some very, I would say, extremely niche cards and obscure includes that I highly doubt that you've ever seen before. So, starting things off, let's talk about delay. So, delay is a two-mana instant. It's one and a blue. And all it says is counter target spell. If a spell is countered this way, exile it with three time counters on it instead of putting it into the graveyard. If it doesn't have suspend, it gains suspend. And basically suspend, you remove a time counter at the beginning of that controller's upkeep. And when the last time counter is removed, you can cast the card without paying its mana cost. So this card is like <laughs> ridiculous, actually. It's an insane like powerhouse, and I initially, when I was getting into the game a few years ago, I saw this card, and I thought it was awful, because I'm like, why would I ever let my opponents cast something for free? But here's the thing. Three time counters is pretty much just a blowout for a majority of people, especially if they've ramped up to some like crazy play, and then you counter it just for two mana, and then the three suspend counters go on it. And it's also a temptation for people who have like their commander, for instance, out on the table or are casting their commander, you counter it with delay. I've had this happen numerous times, by the way. This isn't just like a single instance where people go, you know what? I'm just gonna exile my commander because the commander tax is two turns. The delay is like three turns. I might as well just exile my commander. And then that way I can, you know, get it back for free. So that way I can, you know, take advantage of, you know, at least the free casting of my commander. This never works. <laughs> don't tell people. Don't don't tell people about this in the video. But this never freaking works. Every time the commander gets exiled and with time counters on it, it is now in exile. So the only way to get it out of there is to let the time counters fall off of it or some other mechanic. And if you're running any cards in the deck that proliferate, for instance, you can go ahead and just proliferate the time counters up and say goodbye to their commander. This card is just really good. It puts big decks further behind you can remove key pieces for people. And especially if somebody's playing like a graveyard strategy, for instance, exiling it instead is just 
insane. Hey guys, real quick before the video gets started, I just wanna shout out my Patreon. I finally have the tokens in transit. They're gonna be up on screen now. Now these tokens are done by a custom artist. I have more that are currently in process, but these ones have been finally printed. And as long as the print run has gone well, I'm going to be doing more of these and they are going to be sent out to the Patreon members for free. So if you want a signed token copy, please go ahead and sign up now at my Patreon. It's sort of like a one and done deal. Like once I get this initial run of tokens completed, they are never gonna be available again. So now is your time to go get those. And the best way to do that is to go over to my Patreon account and sign up there. And if, again, if you wanna just get a copy of each of the tokens signed and sent to you and then cancel your membership, go ahead, that's within your purview. You're more than welcome to do that, but you also have to be subscribed over there to get the first crack at actually purchasing said tokens. So if that is something that interests you, please be sure to follow the Patreon and ensure that you're signed up so you can actually purchase tokens from the shop. All right, that's it. On to the rest of the episode. So next up we have Dress Down. And if you're playing CDH, you've probably seen this card crop up quite a bit for you. It is a two mana enchantment that says Flash. When Dress Down enters the battlefield, draw a card. Creatures lose all abilities. And then at the beginning of the end step, sacrifice Dress Down. So why is that so good? So if you're running a non-creature win condition and there are just a ton of them, Underworld Breach would be the most common. Here's a photo of Underworld Breach. Oh wait, that's, that's not it, hold on. That was me helping out my friend and I had to crawl in his basement, so. Underworld Breach would be the most common. You can flash this in at your opponent's end step. And then the beginning of the end step clause has already been met by Dress Down. And this means that it stays on the board for the entirety of your turn because it is now that opponent's end step. You cannot trigger the beginning of the end step clause. So it stays on your turn during the board. And you can also use this to take advantage of shutting out opponents at the preceding opponent's end step to basically remove any large win conditions. Like <clears throat> let's say, like I mentioned, we're in a very like commander heavy, commander centric like build space currently. So if somebody has their commander out, let's just say it's like Corvald or something, and you flash this in at an end step of the preceding opponent, you effectively remove Corvald from the equation and that deck basically can do nothing. It's a mega powerful card. <laughs> it's under $2, which is insane for this type of effect, especially because it's only two mana. And by the way, it replaces itself. It draws from itself. It's just insane. And did I mention that this card also shuts down like ETB effects like Dockside Extortionist, like one of the biggest boogeymen in the format? God, it's just, it's such a good card. If you're not running this or you haven't tried it, I would really recommend you give it a try. And it may depend on your pot a bit, because if you're playing in a more like spell slinger, that type of, uh, you know, heavy instant sorcery enchantment type of like build path, it may not work as good for you in your play group. But if you are playing in mixed pods or you're playing in pods where it's very high on the commander build paths, it's like they require their commander to function. And guess what? You basically just remove them and their turn out of the game. You just time walk them. It's such a good card, so give it a try. The next card I wanna talk about is one that's got me a lot of attention at tables recently when I cast it, and it is Forbid. So Forbid is an instant for three mana, one blue blue. It has buyback, discard two cards, and basically you can discard two cards in addition to any other costs when you cast the spell, so it's on cast, if you do, put this card into your hand as it resolves. So effectively, three mana, discard two, comes right back to my hand. And the effect is very simple. It just says, counter target spell. <laughs> now this card is so good for many reasons. Uh, first off, this card is like never seen. I've, I think I'm the only person that I've ever seen play this card out in the wild so far. And if you're a forbid person that plays this card, comment down below because it's really good. It's slightly more expensive than like a regular counter spell. Yes, but if you have any cost reducer out, anything that makes your instants and sorceries cost one less, it just immediately goes down to the two blue. And basically it's just a counter spell with upside. So if you have that type of stuff in your deck, I might consider having you run this over even a regular counter spell just because of the utility that it offers. And I've been running this in my Lanus Cryptozoologist deck because my hand is almost always just like stuffed full of cards that I really just don't need. 
So being able to control the game with this recurrable, reliable piece of counter magic is just a heaven send. It's so good in those decks. Not to mention the so-called like cost of discarding cards is actually to your benefit. Maybe, let's just assume you're in like Esper Reanimator and you want to have more cards in your graveyard. Now you have a chance stapled onto a counter spell just to freely discard things away to the yard. It's really good. Not to mention that this card is just cracked in a Rael list. It turns any of your discard into filtering draw. So there's various other commanders that may want something similar to this. Those are just some of the more obvious ones that I can think of. So maybe consider giving Forbid a try. I think it's at least worth a look. Uh, it's worth a try to see if you know it might fit into your list, especially if you're running Reanimator. Maybe you run Rael and you didn't even realize this card existed, which seems unlikely with EDH Rec, but maybe you didn't. So give a card a try and uh, let me know how you do with it. All right, let's talk about a slightly saltier card. Up next is Mind Harness. It is one blue for an enchantment that goes on a creature. I don't know if it's been eroded. I assume that it is an aura. So it's probably an enchantment aura. I just don't have the eroded text on here. It says play only on a red or a green creature. It has a cumulative upkeep of one. So basically it's like a mystic remora. Gain control of enchanted creature. <laughs> so this card is very interesting. I can't remember the last time that I was in a four player pod and there wasn't either red or green. And statistically, it's extremely unlikely to not run into these color variants at the table. Likewise, in the current commander centric meta, being able to steal away someone's red or green commander is basically like a blowout. Like imagine just taking somebody's Miram. It's like, yep, Miram is now mine, right? Like that's just like an obvious example. Oh, Atraxa, Atraxa is mine. <laughs> one mana, it's control magic for one mana on specific spells, but it's just a blowout when you get it to happen, especially with the mana efficiency. Like the rate that you're getting on this is just crazy. And I think that this is one of those cards that you want to tailor to your meta you know, like the other ones. So like this card, if you do have a lot of players in your group that play big green stompy, for instance, it might be just a powerhouse in that deck, especially if you can synergize with enchantments. So give it a look. And if it makes you feel any better, if you're just running this card in the wild, out of the top 100 commanders on EDA Trek, 70, 70 of them in the top 100 have either a red or a green color identity. So just out of the top 100, you're at like 70%, and the rates just go up with the more commanders that we see because red and green are extremely popular colors to play. So you're very, very likely to run into these at the table, and being able to effectively just shut somebody out of the game sometimes for just one blue mana is really insane. Again, like if people are building a deck around their commander and they need their commander to make it work, and you just pluck the commander away for one mana, that's pretty good. Uh, it's sort of like Imprisoned in the Moon effects, but this is almost in some ways better depending on the strategy that you're running because you actually get to keep it. And the fact that you can control the creature, especially because you're in blue, maybe you're running some other effects in there that allow you to sacrifice and take advantage of actually like controlling other people's creatures. It seems like a pretty interesting, a pretty interesting play style. So give this card a look if you haven't already. All right, but let's talk about something that's a little bit less mean, and that is Manifold Insights. This is a three mana sorcery, and I haven't really played much with this card, just as a disclaimer, but it seems really interesting, and I'm going to start incorporating it just to give it a try. Uh, you reveal the top 10 cards of your library, starting with the next opponent in turn order. Each opponent chooses a different non-land card from among them, and then put the chosen cards into your hand and the rest go in the bottom in a random order. Let's just like look at this on the surface. So this is effectively three mana, draw three guaranteed non-land cards while at the same time being a political piece. And if you're anything like Yugi Moto, your deck has no pathetic cards, meaning that even if you are unsuccessful in politicking with your opponents to get certain pieces out of those 10 cards, you at the very least have a good chance to pull three stellar pieces to propel your game plan further. And I have been loving more interactive cards like this at the table, which is why it's probably going to crop up in more of my decks because we're there to play with other people. And I think that cards like Factor Fiction 
or this card, for instance, what is the name? Manifold Insights could be very useful in order to sort of achieve that and have a better atmosphere at the table. So that's why I'm going to be running this. Everyone really loves these types of effects when you come across them out in the wild. It's all public information. Nobody feels cheated because it's quite literally their choice as to what they give you. And in the late game, you can use this as sort of like a bargaining chip even to like help other people out. Like, you know, I'll if you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back to keep you in the game sort of deal. It's just a fun include. And I think it really should see more play index like cards like this. Uh, I think it's just because it's not so cutthroat and consistent, it probably doesn't make it into people's decks, but it's a sorcery for three blue. And it's like not a bad rate, right? Like if you look at cards in today's sort of meta, a lot of them are either three or four mana to draw two. This card is three mana draw three and you're guaranteed a non-land. And yeah, I technically it's not draw. Like, so if you run this in like a Niv-Mizzet deck, you're not going to get like the draw effect, but... I don't know if I care because we're getting like insane value. We dig through 10, which by the time we're casting, this is effectively like a ninth or an eighth of our deck, which is a lot of cards. So I don't know. I really like it. Give it a try and tell me your experiences in the comments down below. Did you like this card? But speaking of politics, let's talk about the kind where you hold the entire table hostage. That's right. For only two mana, you can cast an enchantment called Standstill. And it says when a player plays a spell, sacrifice standstill and if you do each of that player's opponents draw three cards so <laughs> this is just another piece that can actually be quite funny at the table and depending on the stage of the game that you're in very impactful it's like go ahead play your card call my bluff for maybe all right everybody we can't let kevin pop off this next turn and we need the chance to draw more cards so how about we let kevin trigger this effect denying him the value while at the same time possibly drawing us more cards into you know counter magic or removal for his board state for instance what's more once this sticks on the table something like a disenchant for instance like an instant speed like removal effect even really can't easily deal with this card because if you do target this the spell was still cast meaning that they can then I can then sacrifice standstill to the ability on the stack. It's sort of like a wasteful use of removal and one that those players that are most behind at the table can enjoy to the fullest. All right, but let's talk about a cute little guy in the form of Nascent Metamorph. It is a two mana shapeshifter and it is a one one. When Nascent Metamorph attacks or blocks, Target opponent reveals cards from the top of their library until they reveal a creature card. Nascent Metamorph becomes a copy of that card until end of turn. Then that player puts all cards revealed this way on the bottom of their library in a random order. Very interesting little tech piece here. You could just run this as sort of like a fun include in your blue decks, but I think it's best used where it has the chance or the upside of doing some crazy things. Enter John Arenicus. So Johnny Boy will gift our little tadpole to somebody else, goading it, and then forcing it to attack. And sure, our opponents can now target us with our little guy, meaning that we don't outright get value from it. But if you've ever looked at a John Arenicus list, you know that there's some downright cruel cards and creatures to turn into. So it's very likely that our opponent won't choose us with the nascent metamorph, and we can hopefully have him target the green player, for instance, revealing, I don't know, a crater hoof behemoth and turning our little guy into a crater hoof to attack somebody else. And likely, if they did target us with the nascent metamorph, it's just going to make their life a living hell because we have, like I mentioned, a lot of very cruel things for our creature to turn into. Also, why not run this in a deck that's heavy with clones or, for instance, like a Sakashima as a commander? You could either do like the partner Sakashima or Sakashima the imposter, for instance. You get ETB value on somebody's big threat that you got off of the nascent metamorph. It seems really interesting. So for instance, maybe our little tadpole boy turns into the new Atali, and now you can play your commander and then copy it getting the ETB value. It just seems, seems pretty good. It seems pretty interesting. It seems silly and random while at the same time offering genuine utility to certain decks and i'm really not fully sure why this is not included in more decks cards like this will produce moments that you remember forever it's like remember the time that i stole your giant ataphage off the top 
and then I copied it with my commander and then by like turn seven or something I had like 16 ataphasias you know whatever it makes some crazy experiences in game I think you know you'll remember it for a long time so maybe give the little guy a try and see what you think all right moving on let's rope back around to some more counter magic let's talk about muddle the mixture so muddle the mixture if you're not familiar with it it's for two blue an instant you counter target instant or sorcery spell but that's not it not all it has transmute so for one blue blue discard this card and then search your library for a card with the same mana value so two reveal it put it into your hand shuffle and then of course as with all transmute abilities they can only be done at sorcery speed now if you know you know this this card's crazy <laughs> it's a great inclusion for your blue list tutoring out win conditions while at the same time being modal enough to disrupt your opponent's game plan or protect your own with the counter magic the counter utility I've been running this in more and more of my decks, and I am so satisfied with how it plays. Maybe I don't need the tutor. If I don't, I'm just glad that I have something reliable in the form of counter magic in my hand to add to the stack. But then in situations where I just need one more piece to the puzzle, one more small thing to make my game plan work, well, now I suddenly have access to it where a regular counter spell would never afford me the utility to do so. And yeah, it doesn't go in every deck but for the decks that want it it's really really good so go ahead for instance go ahead and get a dockside a douthy a bowmaster a psy rift a thassa's oracle a finale of devastation an isochron scepter a time sieve a cursed totem an underworld breach a sylvan library you get the picture it's a really good card and i think that it's probably even at the current rating it's probably underrepresented on edh rec so give it a look now if that last card didn't make you the public enemy this one sure will <clears throat> it's public enemy for two and a blue it's an enchantment aura enchant creature all creatures attack enchanted creatures controller each combat if able and when enchanted creature dies draw a card so this is obviously a card that is better if your local meta is more heavily creature based, not so much spell slingery. The upside to this is you dodge like a crater hoof behemoth kill. The downside is you simply don't play this in a creature heavy meta, meaning it basically does nothing for you. Now, this card shines the most in like go decks, for instance, like for Krog, but it can also be a really neat include in decks like Xur who are interested in tutoring out things. So if you have like a lower powered Xur list and your meta actually trusts you to run a lower powered Xur list, then maybe this will make a good include. Just make sure that you don't go to your combat step before actually casting this. Otherwise your own creatures are locked into attacking the enchanted creatures controller. So keep in mind, it's a symmetrical effect. It affects you as well. But again, if you're not interested in attacking anyway, like if you're just goading everybody's things, I think this is a pretty cool card to include in your deck. So maybe give it a look, see if it fits for you. This next one is really cool. It's a very niche card, very niche include, but I doubt you've seen this at your table, at least within the last like seven years. For those of you that have been around longer, you probably know this card. It is Mind Shrieker for one and a blue. It is a creature spirit bird that is a one, one flyer. But that's not the exciting part, if you're not already excited. Its ability is two mana, colon. Target player puts the top card of his or her library into his or her graveyard. Mind Shrieker then gets plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is that card's converted mana cost, aka mana value. So why did this card end up on the list? So for a bunch of reasons, actually. Uh, did you just tutor to the top of your library? Well, guess what? Say goodbye to that card. Mind Shrieker says for two mana, I get rid of your tutored card and it's gone for good. So it shuts off combo decks. That seems pretty good. Do you have a way to make infinite mana? Well, if you can make infinite mana, you can mill everybody's library out with the Shrieker. This guy also really shines in a Tetsuko deck, allowing you to attack without being blocked, but then repeatedly milling someone's deck to buff up the bird for a bigger hit and for more damage. And remember, you do not have to target the same player that you're attacking. So you can attack the problem player, but then target big green stompy boy over there and hopefully hit some crazy CMC stuff. That way the Mind Shrieker goes ballistic on attack and power. Mind Shrieker also synergizes in decks like Bruvac, meaning that this two mana mill effect actually mills two cards. And this has been 
I, I double checked. I asked the judge. It does work. So you get basically the sum of the mana value. So if you mill two off of this ability because Brewback is replacing the mill effect, you get to add the CMC together. So if you would normally have just hit an eight CMC and then a seven CMC card on two separate triggers, Bruvac says for two mana on the Mind Shrieker effect, mill the top two and then add them together and then Mind Shrieker gets the buff from there. So it would actually be plus 15 plus 15, which seems pretty interesting. It's a neat little tech and I'm going to give it a try in my uh, own, I'm building a Persistent Partitioners deck. I'd like to add it in there just to see how it performs. Um, and also don't take it for granted. This is still a two mana flying blocker. So it really has a ton of utility. And I think that a card, for instance, like Baleful Strix fits the two mana one, one flyer. And yes, Baleful Strix has death touch, but sometimes just having a blocker goes a really long way, especially if it's a modal blocker with like flying. So don't sleep on the Mind Shrieker. Maybe give it a try. I know it's an older card, but it's really cheap to pick up and maybe just include and try in your decks. And it has some interesting utility. So the worst thing that happens is it doesn't work out so well in your specific deck. But if you're running Tetsuko or maybe Brewback, for instance, or you have ways to repeatedly abuse the infinite mana and mill people's libraries out and you need another outlet to do so, this card might fit the bill for you. Now, a card that is maybe not so niche, but I absolutely had to include it in this list is Mystic Reflection. So Mystic Reflection is another, if you know, you know type of card. It's one in a blue for an instant. Choose target non-legendary creature. The next time one or more creatures or planeswalkers enter the battlefield this turn, they enter as copies of the chosen creatures. And you can foretell the card, but that's not really the exciting part. I am always, always, always just dumb impressed by how much this card overperforms. And I'm impressed always by the functionality that this card is able to afford you. So you can use it as disruption. You can remove somebody's commander from the game to ensure that the big threat, like an Atali, for instance, doesn't get that ETB value. You can also stop combo players in their tracks with this card, all the while being useful to your own devices. And if you build your deck in that manner, it's just a cracked card. This card is insane. So do not overlook Mystic Reflections. Let's use an example for how it might benefit us. So let's say that we have an Avenger of Zendikar and enters the battlefield. And the Avenger of Zendikar triggers, and like, let's just say that it wants to make 10 plant tokens. That's the number of lands we have. So you can then cast Mystic Reflection after the ETB trigger goes on the stack, and then you target your own Avenger, meaning that when those 10 plant tokens then enter the battlefield, they enter as copies of the Avenger of Zendikar. <laughs> That means you get 10 Avenger of Zendikars entering the battlefield, and then all 10 of them will trigger separately to netting you a total of 100 plant tokens and 11 total Ave Avenger of Zendikars on the battlefield. If you play one land, you get 11 Avenger of Zendikar triggers, making your 100 plants 11 12s. So for only nine mana, by the way, you effectively put out 1,155 damage on board. Uh, can you see why I love this card? <laughs> it's utility, it's removal, it sometimes acts as a win condition in certain decks. All It's like all in one package. It's incredible. And this card is only like 150 USD to acquire. It's super cheap for what it does. So definitely give the card a look if you haven't already. Let's talk about a card that I think has largely been forgotten about. And that's Reigns of Power for two blue blue to, for an instant. You untap all creatures you control and all creatures target opponent controls. You and that opponent each gain control of all creatures the other controls until end of turn. Basically, you're just flipping boards with you know one of your opponents. And then the creatures gain haste until end of turn. So, for instance, if somebody plays Craterhoof Behemoth, you can then play Reigns of Power, swapping the boards before attackers are declared. It diverts my death, for instance. It's good for that type of thing. Or perhaps you're in Spell Slinger and you aren't going to have any creatures on your board anyway, then it doesn't matter. You get to swap with somebody, oftentimes resulting in a blowout victory, like a quasi-insurrection effect for yourself, basically, which is really good. Or perhaps you want to do something sneaky, 
gifting creatures to an opponent who is currently wide open and being attacked. You effectively disrupt and you know kill attacking creatures that your opponent controls. So you can also sort of use it as a political piece if you're in the right situation. It's another card that's insanely modal. You can do a lot of different things with it, and it results in a lot of interesting game states, I would say. Not to mention that this card is instant speed, so in most Spellslinger decks, at the very least, it has synergy because it is an instant card. So don't overlook that small piece either. I ran this in my original niv Miza Perun deck when I first started playing, and it actually won me a ton of games. <laughs> I didn't really understand how to effectively use it at the time, but it didn't matter. Like, it still was a blowout card most of the time. You got to think, like, a lot of games, how many of you played where, for instance, it would have been useful for you to have somebody else's board, right? Like, you could just take all their creatures and swing with them. Or maybe another example is maybe there's a problem player at the board and you have a sack outlet on your side and you steal everybody's stuff, attack with it, and then sacrifice it all to like an altar, for instance. There's a lot of interesting ways that you can run this card. And I think that by and large, it's a bit like underplayed, I would argue. Um, and that's just my experience because I've had a lot of very good use of this card. But I think until you actually use it and try it yourself, you won't really see how powerful it is. So give this card a try. Let's talk about another four mana card. This time it's an enchantment aura called Psychic Possession. So for two blue blue, you enchant an opponent and then I skip my draw step. So skip your draw step. Whenever enchanted opponent draws a card, you may draw a card. Now, I always look for ways to punish card draw in Commander. Now, Orcish Bowmaster has really taken over the format as like the staple card for this type of thing, as for your card draw punishment. But I think we need more cards akin to this, but maybe in a wider field of varying power options, because like this one is definitely much lower in the power scale than Orcish Bowmaster. But I think we need more variety of card draw punishers in Commander in order to sort of like even out the format and make sure that it like levels the playing field for people that are just repeatedly abusing card draw. This is not the most powerful card. I will concede that point. But if you're in a meta where your friends are doing some degenerate, like infinite draw combos, it gives you the chance to sort of keep yourself in the game. It also has synergy with commanders like Watcher in the Water. It nets you tentacles and other people's turns or maybe Tygam Sidisi's Hand, which forces you to skip your draw anyway, so having this out really has no disadvantage. And even something like a Zyrus of the Writhing Storm, sure, you skip your draw step, but when Zyrus connects for damage, you effectively are gonna draw double, which is pretty crazy. So if anything, this is just a departure from the standard stuff that people play, and that in and of itself makes this a more mentally stimulating include for you and forces you to play with other kids at the table. We need to talk about Kevin. Oh, sorry, I mean Monastery Siege. That's what I meant. We need to talk about Monastery Siege, which is a two and a blue, so three mana for an enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, you choose cons or dragons. If you choose cons, at the beginning of your draw step, draw an additional card, then discard a card. If you choose dragons, spells your opponent's cast that target either you or a permanent that you control costs two more to cast. Notably, importantly, <laughs> this is not ward. It does not use the stack in the same way. It just adds to the actual casting cost of the spell itself. There's nothing that's getting countered here. And that actually does have some utility. So let's bore down on that for a second. There are loopholes that exist for Ward, namely with cards like Leer, Disciple of the Drowned, which states that spells are uncounterable. So if something has Ward on it and you have Leer out on the battlefield, for instance, you can just target that card all day for whatever reason because your spell can't get countered because the Ward trigger is going to go on the stack once you have targeted something. <clears throat> Effectively, if you don't pay Ward, the spell gets countered. But if you have an uncounterable effect like Leer on the board, that doesn't matter. So the ward will try to counter and it will fail to do so. And then the spell just goes through. But with Monastery Siege, it actually adds to the cost, meaning that you have to, like if you want a Swords to Plowshare my thing, even if you know there's no uh, ward cost associated with it, you just are forced to pay two more mana up front as part of the casting cost. So it gets around certain niche situations like that and it's worthwhile to keep that in mind. I've also just 
absolutely been in love with more modal effects like this in games. It's just such a desirable effect for whatever stage of the game that I'm in. I'm happy to play this card out early. It gets me advantage and also gets me card selection. If I'm in an, a reanimator deck, for instance, it lets me discard. It's so good. And then in the later game, it makes my board harder to disrupt. So I get the added you know, cost for targeting, for instance. And I think as the community sort of uh, matures or maturates, we'll see cards like this continue to rise in popularity because we understand that having more modal effects in our decks are what really help us stay in games when otherwise, if we had included something else, would not be the case. Up next is a card that I've really fallen for in my Spellslinger decks, and that is Submerge. So Submerge is an instant for four and a blue. If an opponent controls a forest and you control an island, you may play Submerge without paying its mana cost. So effectively, it's a free instant that says put target creature on top of its owner's library. And yeah, this is effectively a free counterspell for all intents and purposes. Um, well, not a counterspell. You, you get to tuck something on top of someone's library. And the likelihood, as mentioned earlier, of running into a green player at your table is so damn high. <laughs> it's crazy how often this will happen. And as such, them having a forest is also quite high on the likelihood. So this card's success rate, the ratio that you're going to actually get is quite good. And even then, you can still cast it for five mana. It doesn't feel the greatest, but if you're in a pinch, you can still cast it for five mana. So to be safe, for my decks, I often put this in a deck that also has a Yavi Maya Cradle of Growth. So like a Simic list, for instance, because this will ensure that I give my opponents forests when needed, and it just increases the overall consistency of this card. I often find that, you know, when cast on like, let's say an opponent's commander, they're more likely to let this go to the top of their library anyway, because they want to avoid the increased cost of the, uh, the commander tax. So it also works very well on people's commanders. So that player that spent their turn casting their powerhouse commander only to get it placed right back on top of their library for a free card of Submerge being free is very close to just time walking your opponent. It's very, very good. So when it's card, when this card is good, it's just incredible, out of this park, amazing. And when it's bad, it's a five mana, um, a null or whatever the effect is that like puts it into the hand or on top. So when it's, when it's bad, it's pretty bad, but when it's good, it's ridiculously cracked. It's super good. So if you are in a, you know, creature heavy meta, you're playing a lot of Simic, for instance, give this card a look. It's pretty good. So this next card has actually really challenged my belief on what would go in a typical reanimator list. And it is in blue. <laughs> It is a seven mana, so five blue blue, Sphinx for five five, and it's Scholar of the Lost Trove. It is a flyer, and when Scholar of the Lost Trove ETBs, you may cast, target, instant, sorcery, or artifact card from your graveyard without paying its mana cost. If an instant or sorcery cast this way would be put into a graveyard this turn, exile it instead. Now, I think what excites me the most about a card like this is that it's only 10 cents. <laughs> Basically reanimate this for one or two mana, cast something else that was self milled for free, oftentimes something incredibly powerful and then proceed to sacrifice this and do it again, or maybe run this in more of like a blink package repeatedly, ca like having this ETB, casting your powerful things out of your own graveyard that you've put there. This card fits right into an Unesh or maybe a Yenet Cryptic Sovereign uh, deck, for example. But I could easily see this as a clutch piece in any type of reanimation deck, like Esper Reanimator, for instance. So maybe you accidentally milled, like, let's say, your Rise of the Dark Realms. Well, guess what? You just get it back for free now. It's really good. And I'm not saying this is an absolutely busted card, but I think it's really overlooked, especially for that type of application. But I think that... This is just another example of how EDH Rex sort of like pushes out cool includes like this from lists that otherwise may show up on the recommendation list just a little bit lower down. So if you haven't already, give Scholar of the Lost Trove a try and just see if it fits your deck. If you have a few sort of powerhouse instants and sorceries that you are going to be self-milling anyway and you don't have a great way to get them back, 
this might be a good include for you. And yeah, you can definitely run cards like Deluvian Primordial, but this is just sort of like another consistency piece. I concede the fact that Deluvian Primordial is still pretty good. Um, and this card, you know, is more of like a redundancy if you're going to be running that card. But I think that this is a, a good include to uh, look at it as well. All right, brace yourselves. We are in the janky but sort of funny territory at this point. So first up is Parallel Thoughts. Who would have ever thought I was going to talk about this card on the channel? It is a five mana enchantment. So it is three blue blue. And when Parallel Thoughts ETBs, Search your library for seven cards, remove them from the game in a face down pile and shuffle that pile. Then shuffle your library. If, so a replacement effect here, if you would draw a card, you may instead put the top card of the pile you removed into your hand. Now, importantly, that separate pile does not count as a draw effect, for instance, off of something like Niv-Mizzet to trigger, but this is just a hilarious way to either bust yourself or go really big in a game. So you effectively get the seven best cards in your deck in a really condensed pile to pull from. But the risk is that if Parallel Thoughts gets removed, those cards are just sort of locked away in that pile unless you have a way to bring Parallel Thoughts back to the battlefield. This card is 50 cents and I can absolutely guarantee you that if you plop this down at your table, all of the heads are gonna be turning, laughing, and of course, poking fun at you when ultimately Parallel Thoughts gets removed, and then now all of a sudden, you're just like effectively out of the game. But this is the type of thing that just really excites me as a player because it creates this weird table dynamic. Like there's probably gonna be people that are like really scared of you now at the table. And I don't really have a specific commander recommendation for this because quite literally no commander really needs or wants this effect, but it's just sort of a niche include. And my God, is it funny if it were to actually work? Maybe you run this in like a janky combo deck or something to get all your combo pieces. This is your tutor, I don't know. It seems really funny, so give this card a look. All right, next up we have a weird one. It is Captivating Glance, two and a blue for an enchantment aura. You enchant a creature, and at the beginning, or at the end of your turn, clash with an opponent. If you win, gain control of the enchanted creature, otherwise that player gains control of the enchanted creature. And to clash, each of you reveal the top of your deck. Whichever has the higher mana value is the one who wins, and that's how you determine the winner. And then you get to choose whether or not to keep that card on top or put it on the bottom of your library. That's how this card works. So yeah, this is effectively just a one mana cheaper control magic, which doesn't already see a lot of play. And you can absolutely make the argument that control magic is a better include because of the reliability it gives you just for one more blue mana. But that wouldn't be very fun, now would it? <laughs> I love using cards with Clash. They add tension to the table, and it does give you that extra card selection when you actually do Clash, which I don't think ever has really been talked about, like to the best of my knowledge. Like the fact that you get to choose where that card goes now is actually a pretty big deal. If you don't have a lot of like scry abilities or you don't run a lot of top deck manipulation and you just have a more consistently heavy CMC deck, then if you don't want that card that you just looked at, Tuck it on the bottom. Clash lets you do that. So even if you lose, you get that advantage as well. It's really quite interesting. And this effect will continuously go off turn over turn at end steps. So it does give you further card selection if you so desire that. And yeah, like I mentioned, if you build your deck with heavier CMC creatures, you know, for instance, this is in my Sphinx tribal list, you're much more likely to beat out an opponent with Clash while also giving yourself the card advantage at the same time. Card advantage just meaning you get to select where it goes. I don't actually mean card advantage like in hand. I'm just misusing that. And if you're going for chaos, and want something a little more powerful for your group, you can strategically build around this. So that's totally in the conversation. I think that this can either be a more powerful fun card or it can just be like a more budgetary option that adds a little bit more of a dynamic to the table. It's not just straightforward, I steal your thing. It's like, I might steal your thing, but let the gods of chaos decide. I think it's really interesting, so give it a try. So we've talked about a lot of different mono blue cards today but none that effectively ramp you. Let's talk about Retraced Image, which is a sorcery for one blue, reveal a card in your hand, and then put it into play if it has the same name as a permanent in play. Now, this is actually a really funny include if you haven't seen it before. So my brother uses this in his mono blue deck to help ramp him. 
So you can tap your island on turn one, play this card, and then show an island and put another island into play. It actually seems pretty decent. The only problem, of course, in that circumstance is you do have some hand disadvantage, like you go down to five right away. But as long as you have ways to take advantage of your mana acceleration, which you should, then this card is just fine as an application to that. And it really shouldn't be much of an issue. You can also use this in decks like Bruvac. I've already mentioned that, for instance, to put other persistent partitioners in play for one mana cheaper. Or you can also use this in Cosima to help add more voyage counters in a faster manner. And sure, it probably will never beat out green land ramp like ever. But if you're stuck in mono blue, this might be your best option. So there you go, retraced image. Oh, and I'll add in here, it does say any permanent in place. So like, let's say somebody does have like a commander sphere in play or a soul ring or anything like that. You can still show your soul ring and target their soul ring on the board and you get to put it on the battlefield. So there's, you know, there's little niche things like that that you could take advantage of. Or if you're playing a similar deck to somebody else, it has more utility than just land ramp. But I think that's the common application of it. All right, the last underrated blue card, we gotta get this done because my command or my uh, camera is running out of battery and space, is Synthetic Destiny. It is four blue blue for an instant. You exile all creatures you control. At the beginning of the next end step, reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal that many creature cards. Put all creature cards revealed this way onto the battlefield, then shuffle the revealed cards into your library. So <laughs> effectively, this is an instant speed mass polymorph. Uh, this card is most at home in any token generation deck, maybe Kaikar or Talrand or Raynar or Zyrus or Shorakai. There's a lot of different options that stand to benefit from this type of effect, especially if you're building your deck around some larger creatures. Now, of course, you're gonna seem very suspicious in your blue deck holding up six or more mana, I get it. But that's sort of the name of the game with this card. You can pop you can pop this off in response to like let's say a board wipe. You can play it right before your turn to take over the game, etc. Just remember that this cannot be used in an opponent's end step. It has to be used before your opponents actually go to the end step to take advantage of filling up your board with new creatures. And if you're looking for a unique way to end games that also has utility to sort of like protect your board sort of in a way, then this card might be the one for you. All right, guys, that is it. Thank you so much for uh, coming along in a more casual video with me. I love doing these. It's just me sitting and rambling about cards that I either really love or really want to see get more, you know, activity in the magic world. So thank you for being here for that. Please be sure to check out my Patreon, which is going to be shown on screen now. And I do have the tokens that I mentioned. They're currently in transit to me. Um, so as long as the first print run went okay, as long as there's no major defects, I'm going to be getting those sent out to patrons. And if that's something that interests you, you can sign up even at the lowest Patreon tier, and then you'll get signed tokens sent to you for free. You also get the first crack at purchasing said tokens when they finally go live. So be sure to check out my Patreon if that interests you. As always, support my addiction so I can support your addiction. I've been Kyle, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Ugh. The influence of a great teacher can never be erased. Always remember that, kids. Hey guys, real quick before the video gets started, I just want to shout out my Patreon. I finally have the tokens in transit. They're going to be up on screen now. Now, these tokens are done by a custom artist. I have more that are currently in process, but these ones have been finally printed. And as long as the print run has gone well, I'm going to be doing more of these and they are going to be sent out to the Patreon members for free. So if you want a signed token copy, please go ahead and sign up now at my Patreon. It's sort of like a one and done deal. Like once I get this initial run of tokens completed. They are never gonna be available again. So now is your time to go get those. And the best way to do that is to go over to my Patreon account and sign up there. And if, again, if you wanna just get a copy of each of the tokens signed and sent to you and then cancel your membership, go ahead, that's within your purview. You're more than welcome to do that. But you also have to be subscribed over there to get the first crack at actually purchasing said tokens. So if that is something that interests you, please be sure to follow the Patreon and ensure that you're signed up so you can actually purchase tokens from the shop. All right, that's it. On to the rest of the episode.